This week's episode of This Is Only a Test is made possible with support from Storyblocks. Storyblocks is the world's best stock media service offering video, audio, and images with the most affordable subscription plans on the market. Their ever-growing library is over 1 million high-quality, royalty-free assets, so you can bring your content to life more quickly and efficiently than ever before. With Storyblocks Unlimited All Access Plan, you get unlimited downloads of everything in the library so you can try out multiple options and find the perfect fit for whatever you're making. Learn more and subscribe today at storyblocks.com slash only a test. Again, that's storyblocks.com slash only a test. Hey, let's start the show. For Thursday, September 24th, 2020, welcome to This Is Only A Test, the official podcast of Tested.com. Well, that ended abruptly. Not bad. Not bad. Thank you, Rafi, for making that intro music for us. I get a sense that that one might not have been made with us in mind. It could have just been something they had already pre-made and then submitted. But we'll take it. What? You're making accusations now? Well, in, in the past, we, they've other composers have incorporated... This is only a test, some type of techno, some type of theme. This one, while Cynthia uh, didn't, I don't know, didn't feel like it was catered specifically to us, but who knows? Norm likes his name written on his birthday cake. <laughs> Misspelled is okay. As long as there's some acknowledgement on the receipt that it was made for me and not a generic cake, <laughs> that's what I want. That's what I want. Thank you, Jeremy Williams and Kishore Hari. Welcome, you guys. We have a, a full crew this week. How you guys doing? I'm well. How are you? I'm headgeared. Yeah. I have so much headgear going on, multi layers of reality affixed on my head. But we'll talk about that. We'll talk. Kishore, we missed you last week. Um, did you miss our conversation, our, our breakdown of the Facebook Connect announcements? I revelation. I listened to part of it, though I have to admit, I think the. The thing I actually tuned into the most was your Quest 2 review. Um, and my IPD is not, it does not fall into um, uh, the areas that that's most suited around. I'm like about like one or two kind of points away. So I'm very, I've been skeptical about getting the Quest 2 because I wonder how it's going to, how it's going to look and feel. What is your IPD? Uh, I think it's like 67 and a half, I want to say, maybe. It, like, I remember looking and it being like two away from the, one, the numbers that Norm mentioned in the video. 68 is the high end. So if as long as you're, like, if you're 67, that's probably better than being at 69 or 70. And I don't think you have a 70 IPD. Although I think you're absolutely right. Many of the comments and a lot of the people who've been responding and posting on the social media threads you know, are outside of that. And this is a smaller range than was previously available on other headsets or even Oculus headsets when they had independent screens moving left and right. And things that were revealed, and, and you know, I can confirm, like when you move it to 68, you do get a little bit smaller field of view as well. So it's going to be tough. It's been one of those things where I could see some people returning theirs if it's not comfortable because, you know, the, the way they designed it doesn't accommodate everyone perfectly. You know, one quick question I had: Do you you have prescription lenses in your Quest? Mm -hmm. I do. Are you? Do you have any concerns about how that's going to work inside of Quest Two in the context of not having full PD control? No, absolutely not. Uh, because the lenses themselves do still shift, and so mm -hmm. for me, it's close enough the sweet spot to my eyes. The prescription lenses are always recommended. Super, super highly recommended. Um, uh, so much more comfortable for that design than trying to squeeze at least like my style of glasses inside a headset, even with the spacer. The thing I'm looking forward to though is the the new facial interface. There's one from VR cover that's supposed to have some, you know, some uh, some air, uh, some vents for air and also a better nose cover or optional nose cover so you can uh, create a better seal. Uh, but also Oculus has their uh, the wide interface and narrow the fit kit. And I, so I pre-ordered that also because I would still like a better fit around my specific face shape. Yeah. Uh, but 
I want to start off this week with uh, a documentary because it's something that we all watch. I painted you guys about it last night, and uh, I think it's worth talking about. It's kind of related to the stuff that we talked about last week, and of course with Oculus and Facebook. But there's a new documentary on Netflix right now called The Social Dilemma. And uh, it's about the effects of social media and kind of a lot of the things that we as people who follow technology are at least aware of in terms of how social media monetizes and how they track users and the, the, uh, the data profiles they are gathering um, uh, about users uh, for advertisers. Uh, but it was a very interesting documentary in that they had interviews with a lot of executives, a lot of engineers at companies, formerly Google, Twitter, Facebook, uh, and, and Instagram, but also they did a dramatization. It was intercut, these interviews, with this portrayal of a typical American family uh, with parents and kids and kids of all different ages in school who, are, who use social media. Uh, what did you guys think about it? I thought that the documentary, well, not the documentary, the, the uh, dramatization part that it was interspliced was a really risky thing to do because they had a lot of risk to go cheesy and to be, you know, something that, you know, no, people couldn't relate to, especially if they were to take the angle of saying that, you know, Facebook only tries to convert people who are, you know, you know, ignorant or like on the far right or left. And so they did this interesting thing where they, they said in the dramatization, what one of the family members gets coerced by is far center, right? <laughs> so it kind of applied to everybody. And I thought like that that the was extreme actually, center. Exactly. I thought that that was a nice compromise or a way not to like shut people off immediately. Um, but uh, overall, I thought the documentary is required viewing. Like, uh, absolutely, you, whether take it this like dramatization that they interspace or leave it. What the message of this documentary has to say is, I think, absolutely below the radar for the vast majority of people. Despite the fact that there there was a lot of press about how Facebook and and um, Cambridge Analytica were able to influence the election four years ago and uh, elsewhere in the world. Um, like it is, it is now just a part of the fabric of social media now that it can influence people. And one of my favorite points about that the documentary makes is that we've heard this phrase constantly about how if you aren't buying something, you are the product, right? We've heard this countless times, right. but this documentary, I think one of the most brilliant things it does is it, it, it says that, but then one of the people they interview takes it a step further and says that that's too simple. That, that simplifies it too much. Um, what it is, is it's you are not necessarily the product, but changing your mindset is the product. It's just slightly influencing the way that you think and who you are is the product. So yeah. it's, it's actually not, you know, always within you, within your power to, you know, retain your, 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 you know, morals, your, whatever, who you think you are when you're being advertised to like, that's the point of advertising is to affect you. And that's that. That is a hard thing to swallow, right? And that was Jaron Lanier, I, the father, the quote unquote father of virtual reality. Uh, and yeah, he makes that, that fantastic point that, that takes the kind of what we have been reading on, on in the technology news an extra step, right? Like we, I think we understand that we are being advertised to, and advertising and the economics of these business models drive these free services. Uh, but it's the 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 way you phrase it specifically, the kind of subconscious and slow and and um, the, the imperceptible change in behavior, that is something that it's this kind of this coercion that we are completely vulnerable to. And the documentary doesn't pass judgment, right? It doesn't pass judgment on the user. It's not saying that it's because we're dumb. It's because we're human. It's because our brains cannot cope with the magnitude of the the algorithms and the computation and on the other side of the screens that we can't fathom, you know, a hundred thousand years of evolution can't match what Moore's law has done for computing. Yeah. They have a great illustration of Moore's law too, where, where they show the graph going up and then what is the highest that you could possibly imagine becomes almost negligible. And again, and again, and again, they really have a great illustration of what, te how technology has evolved, whereas the human brain has not. So I like this as well. Though, uh, and I agree with uh, Jeremy's assertion that for the vast majority of people, I think there's be surprising information. But 
I didn't leave like being like, oh my goodness, I had no idea. It was not like that experience for me. Like, I think we've been living in a world that has been talking about the impact of of social networks on us for a number of years. So I wasn't surprised about this. And in fact, just like a week or two ago, I actually instituted some like control measures of how often I use social media on my phone and on my browser, because I was noticing an uptick in like, kind of like mean spirited interactions um, on various platforms and how that was really um, leading to some just like unhealthy dispositions in myself at home. Um, So maybe I was already just in that mind state of being like, I need to think of this more as a tool. I think the place that it falls down, like the dramatization didn't kind of work for me, but whatever, you know, that's just, that's Black an mirror light. Thing. I think there was a impression that all of this is so new and different. Um, and while the scale of this, the accessibility of this, the fact that everyone has a phone, that everyone is bombarded with, with these things might be different, I didn't think there was enough acknowledgement of how this sort of manipulation has been going on for a long time. Like seeing the, like when I was a kid, it was uh, at the grocery checkout stands looking at like the the National Enquirer and like, and all those tabloids and how they would kind of seed certain things. Um, there's always been like people that try to sort of get this rise, like we call them trolls now, but they, they existed in the past. And I, I think there needs to be some acknowledgement that there isn't necessarily some new interfaces being created, but just sort of an expansion upon um, already existing um, items that have been playing. There the was stuff that, that, oh yeah, go ahead. There was that one moment in the panel discussion where the, the older guy, you know, basically makes that argument, which is like, this is nothing new and we will persevere, yeah. we will, we will, figure our way through this but the the you know the younger gentleman who worked you know i, I think it was at, at google um he uh you know he said you know this is actually something new that the thing that's new here is the ais that are behind it that are providing everybody with their own tailored experience like yeah mag- I, I magazines get can't the do scale that. yeah yeah I, I and i fully acknowledge that the stuff that always gets me with with these conversations is all the radicalization stuff uh, and that's something that we're uh, in the throes of. Do, uh, like, I, I mean, it, not to sound like every internet bro out there, but did you listen to the reply all last week um, <laughs> where they were talking about A-chan and, um, you know, um, and 4chan and, and like the, uh, just the connection to Q and all of these things. Like it is, um, there is like a whole portion of this ecosystem AI influenced or not, that is just wildly invisible to my experience. Right. Um, and that radicalization, which isn't just, you know, plat, you know, every platform, it's, it looks different. That stuff scares the crap out of me um, in, a, in a really tangible way um, because uh, we have like real legitimate moments uh, in our culture and, and in recent times where that's led to some dramatic consequences. Yeah, and in, in, in some ways, this remind me a lot of watching An Inconvenient Truth, um, you know, decades ago in terms of like it being this warning sign. And the big difference is, of course, Inconvenient Truth, Al Gore ended that with some optimism. And unfortunately, you know, we have not moved down that path. Um, and this is where I think the documentary kind of abruptly ended. And yes, they acknowledge, you know, social media isn't inherently bad and and there are some benefits to the connection that we have and the, the miracles of the magic of technology today and what and, and how our lives have improved with all this um but the prescriptions that they provide were kind of the common sense prescription like the things you talk about Kishore, of just sending personal boundaries and guidelines and this did feel like a documentary made for for parents um like i'm sure a teenager watching this a college student watching this it's probably gonna roll their eyes or not feel like it's impactful for them. But I think watching it as a parent, as someone who is thinking down the line of what this means for, you know, for a kid and giving them access to social media, like this felt a little more resonant to me. Yeah, I wonder for what age though, because some of the content is pretty complicated and requires, you know, a bit of a wide worldview in order to appreciate it. And also maybe some perspective on how it used to be before social media 
So I don't know what age group would really be able to digest it. Like, I don't think my 10 year old would get it. Like, I, I just think that, oh, you know, you know, I don't think or, it's for them to watch. I think it's for parents of those age groups to right. watch, especially and, the ones who in our generation are, you know, some of the last folks who knew what I was like before this curve. Yeah. Yeah. And that's certainly the sort of the thrust of the, of the narrative of the dramatization as you know, the, the parents at one point, they, they decide to lock the, the phones away during dinner that causes an argument leads to a broken phone. And one of the kids <laughs> then has the challenge to leave the phone alone for a week. And of course can't do it. Why would you leave that phone plugged in and not powered off during that challenge? Yeah. Like, there's just some bad scripting and story writing. Those parents were bad parents. Like they didn't, they weren't connecting with their kids in a way to help them. Like they weren't having good conversations with their kids. They weren't engaging them, taking them on like, you know, the, 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 the opposite of the social media addiction is like real human connection. And the parents are in the best possible place to create, to connect with those kids. But like, even at that dinner table and that one scene they had, they were failing at that. Yeah, it definitely was like a riff, riff tracksable dramatization. Like yeah. you could, you could totally see that. But uh, yeah, I, I do think I agree with you. It is definitely something for parents to be aware of, especially like you know, I I still like to think of myself as being tech savvy, but I did not grow up with this, and so and my kids are, and so I I certainly don't know what it's like to have to be a a preteen and have so much riding on my social media likes and dislikes or the, the comments that I might get on Instagram. Uh, my kids thankfully are still not on Instagram or on social media. Um, but it's around the corner. It's a matter of, you know, a couple of years at, at, you know, at the outset, I mean, at the, at the max. Yeah. Uh, it's called the social dilemma. It's on Netflix and I guess Netflix can get away with, you know, running this and making this and producing this because they don't sell ads. They, they and Apple are in a different business model of just taking your money directly. Uh, it's not that they don't buy ads on those very maybe same networks, but uh, they, they definitely, there's, there's no mirror held to them. Um, Amazon, I don't think, could get away with, with running this documentary. For yeah, I thought it was, it was interesting that Apple was not a focus of this at all. I don't even know if they were mentioned, except for in the end, Steve, there's a, a clip of Steve Jobs talking about you know how he thinks of the computer as the the a mental bicycle, sure. um, <clears throat> but you're right. Uh, I mean uh, that's where and that's been a part of their narrative for years now is that they are not in the business of selling ads, they're in the business of selling you stuff. Hey, I, I guess if if all the predictions that they say hold true, and it is scary, right? The one guy at the end, like, you know, what do you think is the the short term, you know, consequence of this? And he's like, civil war, and we're all like, well, you know, looking at what's going on in the world right now, that's that feels like it could be around the corner. Uh, you know, the breakdown of societies, and democracies, but you know, along with those comes the breakdown of the economics models, right? And then the they are less incentivized to to run businesses like this. I do think that was one of the biggest points of the of the film, which is that if you if you look at the you know political division right now, which is like you know just off the chart, and you you have to think to yourself, how can these people on the other side think that way if they if they're seeing the same news that I am, and they're not seeing the same news that you are? Like that's the point, and and it's being driven, you know, not only by social media, also by you know. Um, cable news networks, um, but that that's where that's follow the money. Like it's because that's how you get people to spend more time on your platform is by feeding them information that that algorithmically has been found to you know drive clicks and and time and time spent. So yeah, what what is the solution? What are we gonna do? Are we gonna take our phones away for a week? <laughs> um, I mean, what I the, there was no clear solution given in this documentary. That's one of the starkest things about it. All right, um, Jeremy, <laughs> uh, I'll be by later. We'll put your phone in a bag, and I'll be back a week later. Hey, if that solves the problem, I'm in. The cookie jar. The cookie jar. I mean, it especially is is relevant today where we cannot leave our homes, where we most people, you know, are, are discouraged from leaving homes because of the worldwide pandemic. Like in the past, getting fresh air, going outdoors, playing sports, you know, taking a walk. These were the things that I would do to get away from 
social media, but it is too, way too easy. And I you know we, we acknowledge that, you know, being, being online in this way is too easy. And, and the, the kind of some of the ways that we find a relief from uh, what's happening in the world right now. And so for some people who live by themselves or, you know, don't have families, they're not going to find those outlets. And so we, I think we definitely see it from a different perspective, being older, being more mature, having the same different kinds of, you know, uh, needs and, uh, and having gone through all the, the emotional roller coasters of being a, a young person. Uh, I definitely felt old watching, watching this. And Hey, uh, shout out to Pete Campbell from Mad Men for getting triple roles in this. I don't know if you guys watch Mad Men, but Pete Campbell from Mad Men plays the, the AI ad robots uh, in this and uh, good for him. All right, let's move on to our actual top tech story for this week. Top story this week. You know, as I was watching that documentary, one of the things I was thinking about, we didn't grow up with the kind of social media that the kids grew up today, but one of the types of social media that we did, uh, did grow up with was video games. You know, video games, online gaming was a way we connected with people. Uh, and it, for many people, that is still, you know, their friends groups outside of the, the Facebooks and Instagrams of the world. Uh, and we got new consoles coming out this, this holiday season. Uh, any of either of you get in on the PS5 or the Xbox Series X? Pre-sales? I can't buy shit on <laughs> like uh, no PS5, no Xbox, no RTX uh, 3080. I've just resigned that like anytime a company announces a device, I might be able to get it in 12 months. Um, sorry, I'm gonna go on like a massive rant. I just think the the bot scalping there isn't being enough done, and there's no incentive for the companies to actually change it. Um, and I think what's happening on eBay is just like a travesty uh, unto uh, the experience for so many. <laughs> yeah, no, I didn't get one either. I did, and I was kind of thinking I I might pick up a 3080 this year and and a PlayStation Five, but I wasn't like I didn't I wasn't tracking the launch uh, and I didn't know anything about them. And and by the time that I found out about them, like it was, you know, an hour had passed. And I felt like the sloth in Zootopia, you know. Just, <laughs> I just like, oh, there well, that then, went. The, the sloth in Zootopia also drove a really fast car. Yeah. So that's your thirty-eight eighty right there, right? You're the sloth with all the flops. Yeah. Well, whatever. I mean, I the I I suppose I could have picked up an Xbox because I happened to be there when that launched, but I I don't want that. Um, no, so it's I picked up a Quest too, and honestly, of like all the stuff, that's the thing I want the most. I realize I'm in the minority, but hey, that that's good for me. Hey, you also have an HP Reverb pre-ordered, so you know, I'm looking forward to that as well. Yeah, uh, G2. Uh, it's one of those situations where I, I really wish there was, in, in the way Twitch does it and the way YouTube Live Chat does it, a way to archive the the flow of conversation of tweets and posts on social media when these things happen. Because while I did not partake necessarily in the pre-orders for, for the Xbox Series X, and I had tried for the PS5, uh, following the people that I followed, watching those, those tweets pop up in real time with the frustrations, that is a, that's an ephemeral time capsule of you know, what it's like, consumer culture, gaming culture, internet culture in this month, 2020, that I wish we could look back on. Because I, I, I mean, it makes it made me think back to the launches of previous consoles and the pre-order systems. Obviously, back then it was different. We did, waited in line outside of Targets and Toys R Us's for the PSPs and the, the, the Nintendo Wii's. But, you know, things are shifting. And of course, it's different this year. But yeah, what a what a cluster F, what a, you know, of... The this is your worst journalist take ever, Norm. Like you're <laughs> like, I wish we could encapsulate all the hate and rage of the it's and historical frustration take. over this. It's like I'm, I'm. It's a, uh, it's it's a the anthropology look, anthropological look at internet culture. Because I'm not gonna, I'm I'm not gonna wade in there because of the mess it was. And looking at uh, Microsoft sniping at Sony for how botched their pre-sale launch was, and then failing to meet demand and having their site crash for the launch. Oh my God, what hubris! Uh, well, that hubris also allows them to spend to the tune of eight billion dollars to buy Bethesda. 
Oh, it's only that's seven public. and a half billion. Seven point eight. Seven point eight billion. Closer to the eight, but nearly eight Instagrams were spent to buy Bethesda and the IP they own, which also includes, you know, id Software, Doom, Quake, uh, and I think now the, under the Microsoft umbrella. The purchases of Zenimax, which yes. owns Bethesda and everything that's else. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So pray not, not just Doom and Quake, like you got Skyrim in there, Fallout, um, Fallout, yeah. I mean, these uh, are massive franchises. Pray Dishonored. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They they are massive franchises. And even if you look at them individually, you can say, you know, there's obviously a lot of strong audience and and legacy for Doom and, and Fallout, of course, despite some, you know, the missteps of the last launch at 76. Uh, but it's to bolster the Series X launch and the bolster of their subscription plan. And they really want to bundle this in to their Game Pass, uh, which is really strong with that deal with EA. Uh, and uh, I'm not surprised that Zenimax wanted to sell because, you know, the AAA games business is risky it's you know, it's like the movie business where they can spend hundreds of millions of dollars on a game like fallout 76 and then the critical reception not being where they want it to be it's it's pretty cutthroat i love seeing mike micah's tweet after this news hit um which was uh, hey hey microsoft uh, after the honeymoon we want to talk to you about commander keen <laughs> <laughs> it's like the perfect digital eclipse title you know, the remake, uh, that, this is its game that they made that was like their huge smash hit before Wolfenstein, right? So it's kind of a small scale hit. That, I'm so disappointed that, you know, go back to that Netflix documentary that uh, we talked about uh, where they, the, the history of, of games, of, of console games, you know, from Atari to essentially the early PC games era. And they did a whole interview with John Romero and he wonderfully told this tale about the early days of id pre-wolfenstein and what it was for john carmack overnight to try to replicate the smoothness of side scrolling on a pc uh which mario had but they did not have on pc games at the time and yet he never once they acknowledged the game was commander keen right that was at one point said commander keen was like say the name <laughs> what a right. milestone for pc gaming i had to make mario but nintendo passed on it yeah I can we talk about what this does for Game Pass? Like, isn't Game Pass all of a sudden, which was always kind of a good value in comparison to the other um, offerings, was always a better product. But, like, the limitation has always been about the the launch titles, like the exclusives uh, comparatively to, like, PS5. But now Game Pass comes with what I'm assuming is going to come with all of this stuff. Um, that, uh, you know, is under this umbrella, um, which all of a sudden makes like Xbox much more attractive. Like I was completely out on the Xbox because I want to play, I, I want to be Miles Morales. I want to play like the exclusive, like I want to be in that PlayStation ecosystem because of the games. But this is the first time I've had pause about uh, getting back into the Xbox ecosystem, um, probably going back to like, 360 uh, my i don't follow the, the xbox at all um haven't for, since i had a 360 i have, didn't have the last generation current generation uh but i have friends that do and and a friend of mine who's who's you know in the industry pretty pretty you know and loves the xbox he was saying before this that the game pass was an insane deal like too good of a deal in terms of like being good for developers like it it may not be good for developers kind of level deal because there's so much content you're paying so little it's almost like you could equate it to apple arcade where you're paying you know five dollars a month for a hundred games how could those developers possibly be making a good return on it unless it's simply just funded by apple yeah. um so th this is kind of the same thing where it's like yeah but at what point does it at what point does it stop making sense for microsoft in order to, to fund this level of commitment to, to Game Pass. It's kind of an insane deal. But, you know, I guess you could argue, good for consumers. Um, and, you know, now that they own that company, they own those games, they don't need to make the incremental costs. Their incremental cost is the Game Pass, right? And they see it in the long run. And the fact that, you know, a consumer can look at it and say, it looks like too good of a deal. They love that. They love that because they'll get your credit card and then they'll get that money back from you one way or another and then is, you know, it, is it sustainable like that's what i wonder oh I guess yeah 
yeah. subscriptions are proven to be sustainable. I mean, you look at, I always go back to the example of like Spotify as one of the first successful modern subscription services and obviously Apple, Apple Music and, and all that stuff now. But like you look at your credit card history and like how much I've paid over time for those subscriptions and like HBO. And if you try to break that down to like how many movies or CDs I would have bought, I never would have spent that much money. They got my money. Right, you know, this talk about the social dilemma. Where I'm waiting for that Netflix documentary, the subscription dilemma, coming two years from now. Maybe, yeah. maybe not. Maybe and, from Apple. And <laughs> the Netflix. hardware is exp- is just expensive enough to feel obligated to stay in that uh, ecosystem, that subscription ecosystem. Yeah. Um, the two questions that come up for me are: Are we going to see more acquisitions? I know Microsoft is unique in like how much money it has to throw around here. And I'm not suggesting Microsoft is going to buy more things, but is this going to spur other acquisitions? Uh, and then, like, I have a weird, this is less of a question, more of a take. Like, I have a weird take on this. Like, you know who I think the real loser is out of this? I know everyone's talking about, like, you know, how this impacts Nintendo and PlayStation. I think they're fine. I think Apple Arcade is the real loser. Here. <laughs> <laughs> I, honestly. I honestly, and the reason is, is like, not like it, you can, you, you can criticize Google for their Stadia uh, thing. Neither of them who put so much money in this space really invested in the AAA IP. And now we're seeing what that's going to do to them. They're getting crushed by this. Well, I know different totally market. different platform, yeah. totally different you know, potential user base, blah, blah, blah. Like when I look at Game Pass in the context of Apple Arcade as game subscription services, like forget it. Like well, not even the same conversation. It's why they won't allow Xbox to do Game Pass on iOS and, and streaming on iOS unless they go through the hoops of, you know, having every game be submitted and available by so they can get their cut because, you know, it's a place where they are not, they are not strong. Uh, yeah, it's, it's. I don't know if Apple Arcade was a success to begin with. You know, I mean, they they had there was press a couple months ago about how they were completely revamping their approach to games. They wanted games that were stickier, and like one of the one of the games that they used as an example was you know one of these like match three games that, you know, it wasn't Ugh. it wasn't a Bethesda game. It's completely <laughs> different. Um, you know, I like I love it. I love that Apple enabled compatibility with Xbox and PlayStation game pads. That's great, but they'll never be a game platform like in the, in the same sense because that's not their that's not what they do best. But but now they're fighting their subscription company. That's what the Apple One bundle with multiple pricing points within Apple One. There's yes. multiple Apple Ones. I, I, that's who they are now as a company. So um, guess what? Xbox and PlayStation are their subscription companies now too. So, like, I would say they're more of a competitor now to those places than they were uh, a year or two ago. I mean, to go back to the early point in the social dilemma of like, what these companies are trying to do, they're trying to get your screen time, right? The same with the game consoles. They might not be for advertisers, but what they want to do is when you have that TV in your house and you're on the couch, because that is something that people do, sit in their living rooms, on their couch, eat dinner, you know, they want you to spend that time playing a game versus watching Netflix versus browsing the web. And that doesn't work when you're you know, traveling and you have your phone. So what the Apple Arcade is competing against is for the time that people are using on their phones. And those games, while they can be... It's, it's why the Match 3 games work, because they, they work on that same dopamine trigger that the, 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 uh, the slot machines uh, work on, which is what the same triggers that the social media networks work on. And that's what people are going to gravitate toward on those devices. It's it's all dystopian. No good news this week. Hey, one piece of good news. John Carmack tweeted in response to Microsoft buying ZeniMax and said, uh, to quote, great, I think Microsoft has been a good parent company for gaming IPs and they don't hold a grudge against me. So maybe I will be able to re-engage with some of my old titles. Commander Keen, VR, you heard it first. <laughs> I think we're all thinking maybe a different one, but uh, <laughs> you know, we're, we're watching the, the Facebook Connect keynote. And I think I tweeted at you like when Zuckerberg did his, his, um, his 
playing Echo VR with Boz. I was like, this is the this is the Bill Gates playing Doom and Windows 95 moment for, for Zuck. And you know, just days later, Microsoft bought Doom. <laughs> so Wait, is, we're is all there coming a, full circle. Is there a video of Bill Gates playing Doom? Wait, you don't know about this? I don't remember that. No, this I have to look when that they up. promoted I tweeted it. Uh, like you can, yeah, you can Google Bill Gates Doom. But when he was doing, maybe it was a CES keynote, but it's definitely a video recorded of him promoting Windows ninety five. One of the big things with Windows ninety five was all the graphics, and so they did this whole thing where he's like, hey, "You can play games like Doom," and then they did like a mixed reality thing where he's like holding a Doom gun, he's blasting away at the at the, and it was like the big selling point of Windows ninety five. All your games are compatible too. Yeah. That's what it made me think of with the Zuck playing Echo VR. And of course now, like I said, Microsoft and Doom. But Doom VR, to come full circle, it was what John Carmack was so excited to show off on that duct tape together Oculus Rift. Uh, DK1, way back at, uh, was it QuakeCon or E3, uh, E3 2012? And dude, I don't think that was a DK1. That was like DK0. <laughs> yeah. That was like, that was the first VR demo. Like, you know. Uh, from of of yes from Carmack or or Palmer Lucky like that was early and you're right I'd love to see that come all the way full circle yeah well we're gonna get Doom three hopefully on side quest at some point soonish so you know yeah. it may happen whether Carmack's involved or not but it'd be extra cool if John Carmack was involved all right we're gonna do reverse order for podcasts for the rest of the show this week so because we wanted to catch up on all the stuff that happened after uh, we podcasted last week for Facebook Connect so let's get to the VR minute. The VR Minute Virtual Reality This Week. I'm going to flip down my visor. Uh oh. Yeah, there it goes. I'm wearing a Aug- hall lens too. Augmented reality. Aug- this week. I, I, I just want to be clear to our audio listeners that was not the sound of the device. That was actually Norm's <laughs> sound effect that he made. I, I want to be PS. really upfront. Uh, so John Carmack did a live stream uh, toward the end of the, uh, Wednesday, 5.30 Wednesday. It's all online, all archived on YouTube, so you can watch the whole thing. It's worth well worth watching, an hour and a half, very unscripted, just talking through a debrief of like the decisions that went into designing Quest 2 and and uh, and and uh, you know uh, mobile VR and it became very clear listening to Mike Abrash's talk and John Carmack's talk that you know it's something we kind of knew but these are very separate teams that the AR side of Facebook which is I think it's a bigger than the VR side is that they are working toward their own pipeline, their own technologies to get to the dream of AR glasses. And while VR, a lot of stuff in terms of the world sensing stuff and the slam stuff will probably converge on the VR side. That's a very product focused side right now, making the quest to making games and making things that are shippable, which is what John Carmack is fundamentally interested in. Uh, some big takeaways in talking about the hardware, you know, the Qualcomm chip, the XR2, uh, he acknowledged much faster, of course, its latest generation, but does not uh, is not used to its full capacity in the Quest Two. That they're because of thermal load, they can only basically get about fifty percent um, of the fifty uh, percent faster than the eight thirty five that they had. Uh, while GPU, they can use more, and there are things that, of course, they can tap into in terms of the. Um, the special processors for for imaging for I/O uh, that you know he went to the nitty gritty of like the things they had to change to accommodate you know the the chromatic uh, aberration tweaks and the compensation in that um, they did but, a lot of the the tracking in, using the DSP and the that's what it means five yes. and yes. so they, he said they have a lot more toys to play with now and we we didn't see obviously hand tracking launch until well after the launch of the Quest so that's the kind of thing that they were able to discover and employ. Uh, now they have even more at their disposal. I don't think we've seen the last of what the Quest 2 is capable of. True, very true. And one of the things that he griped about was just, this is a big team right now. Like there are lots of different teams working on their Quest 2. And organizationally, it makes a lot of sense that they're kind of disparate. You know, there's a team working on Guardian. There's a team working on the core UI. And there's a team working on the game stuff and the store. And all of that gets composited together with the compositor, with their shell. And that creates inefficiencies. And that's one of the reasons Quest 2 isn't shipping with 90 hertz native. It's going to be a beta feature because Guardian wasn't ready. Because that, that pass-through only still ran at 72 and there were some incompatibility at 90. Uh, so these are kind of like the, the 
wonderful little insights. And, you know, he has, he has a product person has strong opinions about things like ergonomics of controllers and, and uh, just usability. Uh, and so it's, it's really interesting to dive down into for someone who has a lot of say and makes cases, you know, from a user perspective as well, into what goes into a product, you know, things that he fights for and pushes for, uh, for a product like, like quest two. And I think most notably among them is a wireless link that he said he's a proponent of. And uh, he gets pushback. Apparently, like he's like, there's two sides to that discussion. And he said, I don't know, he, he implied that they can get quite heated, um, yeah. that people who believe that a wireless link should and can be, you know, uh, done even better than it's been done so far. And there is clearly a use case for it. There's people out there using vir virtual desktop to stream off of uh, the computer to the Quest and having an experience that they consider to be perfectly comfortable and usable, they pre preferable in many cases to, to having a link cable. And yet there's people on the other side of the argument who say, nope, it's not gonna be as good as a wired link. The, there's gonna be more latency. The quality is not gonna be as crisp. We're not gonna do it. And I am 100% on Carmack's side. And so much to say, like when, when it launched last week, I, I suggested maybe there's hardware in there to enable it in the future. But yeah. I'm, I'm hesitant to, to think that now. And unfortunately, I don't know if we'll see wireless link. And he even gave the name AirLink. And I don't think, you know, he's, he's not holding out on that, I think Link itself is something that they're they want to spend the resourcing to improve because that will be the way to play the desktop games with Quest Two with the Rift S going away. Uh, they never really fully answered about the Wi-Fi Six. I think you know XR Two has Wi-Fi Six capabilities, they, but yeah. not in a sense of whether it actually taps into the full bandwidth. You know, he said it's a 2x2 connection, which is, yes, you're going to get like 300 megabits, but the full potential of, of Wi-Fi 6 is an order of magnitude above that, and we don't have clarification about whether the radios are in there uh, for that, that part of the spec. Um, but yeah, definitely really interesting, um, and uh, you know, it's, it's a product that they were very impressed to have turned around so quickly after Quest 1 shipped, and as of right now, uh, you can still pre-order it on, on places like Amazon and still get it on launch day on October 13th. Oculus's uh, shipments have been pushed to first week of November, but I, I guess, yeah, some of the retailers still have them available for launch. Yeah, and then there are a couple other interviews that are worth watching. Uh, MKBHD did a podcast interview. It's on YouTube uh, with, um, with Zuckerberg himself about how he sees these technologies and so much of it is about the idea of presence for him of connecting people you know it's a lot of just the, the same kind of pr talk we've seen um but uh distinguishing i think importantly between how facebook sees an augmented reality product versus how google saw like a google glass type product you know the idea of notifications being popped up on screen was less interesting it sounded like from facebook's perspective um you know what things that an apple watch might do than the kind of enhancement of senses which ties into something that michael abrash has talked a lot about which is what ar for him feels like it's the super Superpower. It's a thing that can can identify your what you're looking at and give you you know information about it. Augment your your audio clarity and all these uh, senses that you take take for granted, um, giving you that extra not just layer of information, but um, the the way you interact with it visually and auditorily. I mean, this is a superpower already. You know, it's a, I mean, you want to translate into any language, you're speaking to somebody who doesn't speak your language, you can do it. You know, you can find directions to anywhere. You can look up anything on Wikipedia. Uh, but to, yeah, to put that in terms of your live real-time senses, that's yeah. another layer, man. That's going to be something else. Yeah, and I think audio, you know, there was that uh, Facebook Reality Labs video that came out about audio sensing and, you know, using focus to be able to pinpoint and hear things better. Um, that's something that is solvable. I think that's why the video is out there is because the, the optics problem is still so much, so many unknowns um, that maybe they're not ready to share yet, but the audio side of it is they can see that roadmap to making that a valuable killer app for AR. Um, and so I'm glad they're, they've shared that. Uh, other news that came out is that uh, from the sessions is that uh, the Quest is now going to allow or will soon allow after launch Quest 2 will allow the downloading of unlisted apps, not via the in-store menu, but basically through a, a web link or uh, you can click you know, a, a website or click it on your phone and then it will queue up for download on your headset, an app that does not need to be approved by 
their moderation team or their QA team. So it essentially, it bypasses the need for side quest. And side loading at all. And side loading at all, completely. And there was an interview from the creator of side quest about you know, his thoughts on this. And it's, it's good for developers. And uh, I think Facebook will still take a cut for apps that will charge based on that listing. It just won't be surfaceable for people who just want to browse through the store in headset uh, or the store via the standard Oculus app on their, on their phone. Uh, but basically, it kind of takes away from that business. And they're going to integrate, I think, those links into SideQuest, SideQuest and make that more of a, a curated place for people to find those links. Um, but the, the ability for SideQuest to be the only place, really, for you to get those APKs easily loaded onto your headset, um, that's going away. I mean, I think it's good for developers, um, but I, I also appreciate what SideQuest has done. Um, I did finally watch that video that you mentioned last week, Jeremy, of Infinite Desktop. This is that Mocha Abrash experimental thing with the, the track Logitech keyboard. No brainer in my mind. Track input, track keyboard, I think is going to be so much more practical and usable than the virtual keyboard uh, or even virtual cursors using gestures, both because of latency, latency and also precision. Uh, but Man, I walked away from that being like, no one's going to use their headset. This, this like, this fantasy video of someone walking around their house putting on a headset using pass through just to, you know, do some collaboration. It seems su such like a bootstrap, cobbled together demo using existing technologies. I could not imagine a virtual workspace actually functioning like that. Yeah, I wonder if the resolution is high enough in order to really feel good. Um, but it's certainly, you know, it's what I see that as is just the Quest is a great, cheap prototyping tool for augmented reality. You know, people yeah. working on those teams can get started now in developing what those, you know, just experimenting, seeing what those experiences might feel like, what what works and what doesn't. And you know, the dream of not needing monitors and being able to make all your monitors virtual around you and having the slam of the device know where your desk is and remember where things should be. I mean, that's that's real. And uh, it looks to me like they're already making some headway and we might even be able to test that out ourselves. You're right. I don't think it's going to actually be a desktop replacement for anybody. Or the way they portrayed it in terms of hanging on the couch and then, you know, oh no, I want to get away from, you know, the, the housemates and go to a different place and then pull up the, the VR interface. It's like, there's so much of the user experience in the UI in their demo that felt incomplete. In fact, like the closest I felt to using that kind of virtual collaborative desktop environment was in thing like big screen where like the three of us would be sitting in a virtual uh, theater and we'd each have our desktops in front of us and our own suite of drawing tools in front of us in our near field. And we could see that you were looking at your menus, you were looking at your desktop on the side and then maybe throw something up on, on the, the big projector or the big theater screen. Like that felt like more akin to what a virtual collaborative working environment would be like. Um, I want to yeah, give a shout out. Yep. Got it. I'm just gonna say, like the, the the augmented reality would in, would put you in my environment, and that that's yeah. I think that's what people want, and that's why they're employing the the black and white pass through, yeah, yeah, to to make that happen, and that's why I mean they need to prototype that experience because that is the one that's going to be the mass market product someday. I got a taste of that experience today. And that's why I'm wearing this headset right now, this HoloLens. So the reason I'm wearing a HoloLens too is I have this on loan from Spatial. They're a company that, or they did a, a video um, a presentation. They were part of one of the presentations at Connect uh, last week. But they make a product that's available on Quest now and available on HoloLens and will be on Unreal. It's AR, it's VR, it's also browser-based. It's completely asymmetrical, but it creates a virtual environment where if you're in VR, the three of us could be VR avatars and could be drawing, pulling up web browsers and writing on sticky notes and putting things on a virtual whiteboard. But the AR experience that I got today, I was in that same virtual environment, but it was my living room. And then I had avatars floating around my living room, throwing things up on my the wall that I pinned as my anchor wall uh, for for sticky notes, for objects, and pulling 3D objects that they had uploaded from their web browser, their their computers, and then those objects appeared in my space and I could manipulate them, expand them and, and shrink them. And it was, it was cool. It felt yeah. like collaborate, exactly like what you're talking about. What I wanted the, the, the AR collaboration to feel like where I could still be on my laptop or on my phone, but then 
someone could pop in and I could see their virtual avatar and then have a conversation with them and feel like they're in the same room as me. How does the HoloLens 2 compare to other AR headsets that you've used in terms of field of view? So it's about 50 degrees and a little taller than it is wide. So much better than the postage stamp you know, window that was in hall as one. They do a good job. You can see if you're watching the video that, you know, they, they cover up almost my glasses, but in the same way the Enreal did, there's a lot of like just space underneath the glasses where because it's beyond where the lenses are, my brain naturally doesn't expect there to be holograms outside of that field of view. So they've kind of hardware framed in. And even within that, they've done software vignetting where objects disappear gracefully, you know, fade away when they're outside. Um, to one more, I do have to train my head. It's less of my eyes looking around. There is eye tracking, but it's more my head looking around to place the objects back into its field of view. But the thing I love so far about using HoloLens, no controller, it's the hand tracking. And using the hand tracking, like right now, I see these rays that are cast from my hands, laser pointers essentially, and I can pull them up and I can look at my wrist and tap a start menu button, and I have a menu now popped up right here, then I can actually poke into and navigate like a start menu. This is what Magic Leap didn't have. Magic Leap had their, their totem, right? Their threed off, or no, it was, it was sixed off the magnetic, but it, their, their controller. It was a hardware was, controller. It was a hardware controller, and it just wasn't as intuitive. So this combines that hand tracking that I love from using the Quest and using... Um, what was it called? Uh, that uh, the, uh, the hand tracking, um, the 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 the, <laughs> the IR blaster thing. Remember, what, what am I thinking of? Uh, the IR, thing put, the thing that you put on your desk and you put your hand. Oh, yeah, not Magic Leap, but uh, Leap Motion. Leap Motion, right? Leap Motion, the, the kind of hand presence that Leap Motion and the Quest hand tracking have. That feels like they've brought that into AR. And the gestures of like clicking and, you know, scanning the world, the slam is all really nicely done where they have these geometric forms that can wrap around the walls. I can see that it's mapped that plane. Uh, it's just really, really nicely integrated. The, I love the, the idea of, of pressing something on your wrist because that's what Oculus calls passive haptics, you know, because you yeah. still feel something. There's still something tactile there, but you don't need something active to, to get that feedback. And these, this is a fixed focus headset, right? Like there's a sweet spot for where the menus are. It's not um, verifocal. So where when I press this micro, or this start menu button on my wrist and it pops up. And we can hear that. You can hear that. Okay, so it's popped up. It is like right here and it's perfectly crisp. It's like right floating right in front of the camera lens right here. And I can tap the arrow keys and go to all apps. And I can like, like it, it is a fully... It feels like I'm interacting with this perfect like, floating object in front. The opacity is pretty good. I mean, I can Resolution? see the camera behind. You know, it's the same kind of waveguide artifacts where you see like the rainbow effects and you see kind of interlacing. And but text is crisp. I can read web pages. I can read the UI, and it's you know it, it gives me a lot of hope for for AR. Yeah, from a consumer standpoint, it still feels like something I'd want to be working and wearing at a desk here and at most in like a living room and not really out in the real world. But I think that's kind of what's accepted by Apple and Facebook and, and Microsoft. And I, I think we hear so much about Apple's, the rumored plans for their AR classes. And of course, Facebook being, being very open about pursuing AR as the thing past VR. Uh, um, but Microsoft has a headset in the marketplace right now that works, that people are using, that big companies are using, um, and their apps like Spatial that take real good use of it. Um, and so they, you know, they're a sleeping giant there. That's cool. Um, I'm gonna flip up my glasses now as we exit. Us. Well, welcome back, Luke. How was your oh. lightsaber training? Oh my goodness! I, I could, <laughs> I could feel it. I could feel the blaster fire. <laughs> um, let's move on then to a moment oh my goodness where's this a moment of science now it's time for a moment of science uh so a quick thing before we talk about tesla battery day which is actually some exciting science for once 
Uh, we passed a grim milestone in the United States uh, just a couple days ago with 200,000 uh, COVID deaths uh, confirmed uh, by GHU, uh, by Johns Hopkins, uh, and uh, a, a grim milestone in the context of we're probably uh, significantly undercounting the number of coronavirus deaths in this country. Um, the estimates are upwards of, uh, of 10 to 15 percent of an undercount. Uh, so it's just another reminder that uh, uh, of what has been sacrificed uh, to get us to this point and how much farther we have to go. There is a lot of vaccine news that is going to inundate all of you. Uh, and I have a piece of advice. Try to stay away from it. Um, this is something I said, I think almost six months ago, or at least like four or five months ago. Um, there is going to be a lot of ups and downs with the rollout and distribution of any vaccine, uh, even if it's proven uh, safe and effective. Uh, and I think for the wide majority of us, we're not going to you know, see a product like that for, um, for months, if not a year uh, or longer. Uh, and which means that um, you know, what's happening now, while it might be interesting, um, is probably going to go through a lot of ups and downs. So I'm actually uh, staying abreast of that topic, but not uh, getting too involved in it, because I know there's still a lot more ups and downs to come uh, as we head towards uh, uh, an approval. All right. Tesla Battery Day. Uh, this was the hyped event that was supposed to happen, I think, in early May. Um, and had been pushed back and uh, Elon got on stage and talked about their entire cost structure. Um, and I want to sort of break down the, the battery component of this. So typical battery, anode, cathode, um, and in the context of the batteries that are in Tesla cars, uh, they have tabs that are essentially welded onto uh, the battery context to direct the flow of electricity into the larger system. Um, they indicated that in terms of the manufacturing cost uh, to make those batteries, like something like 55%, maybe 65% are the raw materials. So like 35% is the cost of nickel, 25% is the cost of lithium, which is really the material that the uh, electrons move through, the substrate. Uh, and then 5% is the cost of cobalt, uh, which is uh, another rare earth item. Um, but really 35% of the cost is, is sort of like in processing and, uh, and then there's manufacturing costs on top of that. And a big part of the cost is this idea as they build the battery is welding on uh, these, uh, these tabs onto the battery because it takes time, there's precision, uh, and that time equates to additional cost and uh, in the overall process. And so what he laid out was this idea um, that uh, we saw some patents for earlier in this year, uh, which is a tabless battery that's almost like sort of like a jelly rolled up uh, battery. So imagine like uh, like a fruit roll up um, where there's layers of the battery that sort of rolled together. Um, and within it, um, there's kind of spiky elements that essentially poke into the next layer. Um, and that sort of poking into the next layer is how the electrons will actually cross in this battery. So as opposed to sort of being the traditional way of um, you know, flowing from the anode to the cathode and then out the, the tab, so there's one exit point for the electricity, there's gonna be multiple points for that, for those electrons to flow uh, and then exit the battery. Um, and because of that multi-flow, they can manufacture these a lot faster because they don't have to weld on these tabs uh, and the process goes uh, quicker. Then on top of that, seem to indicate that um, we can actually uh, start using silicon in these batteries that is cheaper than the graphite embedded silicon that's used uh, conventionally, which I think is, what was the number? I think it was $6 per kilowatt hour. Uh, oh no, $10 per kilowatt hour for the um, graphite embedded uh, silicon. Uh, and their process is dipping this um, sort of a, a less sort of purified silicon in uh, into this conductive goo, which they didn't really talk about. Um, and that coating will allow them to take the cost down from $10 a kilowatt hour to $1.20 per kilowatt hour. All this was very future facing. 
It's not like they bought it, brought out a battery and was like, here we go. Here's the tabless battery and it's ready to go. It's all seems like it's two to three years away. Uh, but this improvement in manufacturing processes is what's going to drive down the cost of the Tesla and drive up the availability of it. So uh, this this whole idea of miniaturize or changing the process to tabless, it, uh, tabless battery is how they get to a $25,000 a Tesla and how they get so many more of them out there. The thing that I'm most skeptical of that they spoke to was this idea of using the lithium that's just in embedded in clay that's just sort of widely available throughout Nevada and being able to purify that. Did you hear that part of the of the uh, thing? That was a very strange part of the presentation that I don't sort of buy. Um, and I think there's going to be safety and performance benchmarks. I like from what I read from a number of uh, engineers, the tabless battery as a concept and design totally makes sense. Is it going to have the same the the ideal performance that um, that Elon laid out over an extended period of time? Um, are there going to be other complications at, in the manufacturing process at this scale? Um, that are going to um, that are going to cut into those cost savings that uh, he's indicating. Uh, is it going to be as easy as sort of retrofitting elements of the Gigafactory as he indicated to to drive this forward? I don't know. Yeah, like you have to actually have to have a battery at the end of the day. But the promise is five times as much energy in this forty six eighty battery, which is forty six millimeters by eighty millimeters, um, which means like an increased range of almost twenty percent on your car twenty five thousand dollar car i mean i don't think they'll that's uh, everything regarding price i i think is taken with a huge grain of salt um you know like like the thirty five thousand dollar model three but it may not matter because that's you know that's for investors and the economy will change and you know demand will determine the price i don't always say this about um announcements that elon makes but the tabless battery is legit from like a science standpoint, everything is about how their the ability to manufacture it. Um, everything that was said in terms of uh, reducing costs uh, seems to line up with what experts think is possible. Um, but it's one thing to, for experts to say it's possible. It's another thing to manufacture at scale. I wonder at what point Tesla becomes a battery company primarily. I think they already are. And they just buy from themselves. Yeah, well, they they said they're still going to be buying from like Panasonic and LG and all the other um, manufacturers in the short term, just because they are uh, they have so much demand that they they need those. Uh, but they felt they said like even with buying up all the supply they can get their hands on, they would have a shortage by 2022 in order to meet the pro uh, car production they they need. Um, I don't know. This is this is not dissimilar to what Apple's doing. This is complete vertical integration from soup to nuts, or what did they say from cells to cars uh, <laughs> is what they said. Uh, but it is very much the same playbook that Apple has from the chip manufacturer all the way through uh, to the end user product. Um, and uh, so from that sense, like if you think about this in an Apple context, you can see the play. And while they are a car company now, you know they also sell batteries for the home and there's a huge market for that. So in the same way that, that like we always say, the iPod, iPod Nano helped make the, the scaling of solid state drives you know, feasible for iPhone, you know, this all works for power cell in the future. Uh, all right, uh, we are, ooh, we're only about 10 minutes left, so we're gonna do a speed round for our next section. We're skipping technology because I feel like we've covered that um, with the top story and with the talk of the documentary. So we're gonna go to pop culture Next. Oh, that was my alert that I have to be done in 10 minutes. <laughs> you get an extra bit of alert. Hope it's not too triggering for those of you who also use Google Calendar. Okay, um, first bit, uh, a wonderful podcast song exploder. Man, this is the whole thing. Podcasts get turned or, or Twitter accounts get turned in TV shows, but Song Exploder is getting a TV show on Netflix and they're going to have a Hamilton song coming October 2nd. 
This is great. This is great. This is, makes perfect sense. I mean, you put me in a boardroom with a bunch of smarties, I would have said the same thing. <laughs> I love Song Exploder. It's a wonderful podcast that takes one song and analyzes it, breaks it down to its component parts, talks to the musicians who wrote it, talked about how they made it, what, what was the thinking, what were the inspirations, what were the different parts. It gives you, it like multiplies your appreciation for any song that's on that podcast by a million. I love it. I think the thing is, the challenge for them is to make it interesting across all genres of music for people who may not know the songs or maybe not into those genres. And then obviously they're getting much better access with Alicia Keys and Lin-Manuel and, you know, very popular songs, but they run in that same, you know, rock band problem where like, I only like these songs. And so, you know, you try to please everyone. So they have to make it interesting and, and have some mass appeal. And obviously the producers know that. I'm looking forward to it. Hey, um, I'm just excited that a podcast that's been around for a long time um, is getting its due as opposed to like celebrity coming in to host a podcast, which is where, how the industry is going. I mean, those, yeah, there are some, some great podcasts out there and some great celebrity hosting a podcast shows out there as well. Honestly, uh, music now is so commoditized. It's like, I don't think people, I think people stop thinking about the art of engineering a, a good song like, you know, years ago. I think kids just listen to music and think it fell off a tree somewhere. Like this is going to be a good show for enhancing people's appreciation for that process, the creative process of song making. And that creative process has changed because of True. collaborations and remote collaborations. There was a the whole TikTok thread. The best thing to come out of TikTok was those, those uh, the back and forth people sampling each other, creating interesting beats, and then you know creating duets right remotely, completely asynchronously. Has some of the best stuff. All right, MCU news. We've got some casting news. Uh, Ant Man three has its villain. It's Jonathan Majors cast as Kang. Holy moly! What's this mean? I thought for sure he was going to be a big bad. Is he going to be a smaller bad, or is this just going to be an intro? This <laughs> is massive news. <laughs> Kang the Conqueror is one of those cosmic, crazy comic book villains. It's like it's not your traditional superhero villain in in, in the movies. Uh, but yeah, he's a Thanos. time traveler who sucks at time traveling. Basically, <laughs> yeah. he's a time traveler who like fights younger and older versions of himself, and like it's like is just always fighting against his destiny of like of of losing, right? Um, but there's in the comics canon it's revealed that he is possibly an a, a, a ancestor to reed richards also dr doom who knows time travel gets funky and weird and all sorts of stuff but uh the theory is that this may be a way to introduce the larger you know fox acquired licensed movie universe stuff into the mcu and Ant-Man is already a weird time traveling cosmic quantum realmy, you know, they're going to, they got the Rick and Morty writer in there for Ant-Man three. So, you know, the, it feels very right that they're going to go with Kang potentially as the villain. Offbeat. When you Jonathan mess with Major. time, it messes back. <laughs> That's true. Don't push back. Uh, Jonathan Majors is currently in Lovecraft country. Amazing, amazing show. Uh, you guys should watch it. It's uh, along with the boys, two favorite shows on television right now. Also, Star Trek Lower Decks. You can handle uh, the boys, man. That oh, show yeah. gets me down. Oh, it's so depressing. Too it, much. It, 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 Stormfront is too much for this current moment in time. Yeah, Lovecraft Country, it, it, while imperfect and definitely some editing and storytelling pacing problems, uh, the last three episodes extremely strong. Also, start off strong. The pilot. So good. Okay, back to MCU news. Uh, TV show news, MCU She-Hulk has been cast. It's Tatiana Maslany uh, from Orphan Black, as well as Perry Mason most recently. Wonderful casting. Amazing casting. Amazing casting. She-Hulk's yeah. a lawyer, as opposed to He-Hulk, who's a scientist. <laughs> Is this uh, is this canon? Is that true? It is. She's she's the the uh, cousin to Bruce Banner, and her portrayal has been wide ranging. We'll say in the comics, uh, but it's about just like the dual personality of she's when she's Hulkified, she retains all her intelligence. It's not like the dumbed down Hulk that we get. So it's just the super strength. Uh, but 
I mean, we assume they're going to go with a CG portrayal for the Hulk version, and uh, she's just a ver- such a versatile actor that um, I can't wait. Yeah, I think it's great casting. Uh, also, in the MCU, we have the trailer for Wanda Vision still coming out this year. So, Black Widow just announced today, pushed back. Eternals pushed back. Shang Chi pushed back. Movies are not going to be great this year, but we're getting. Falcon Winter Soldier, and we're getting WandaVision, and the trailer for WandaVision looks like they put that money on the screen. Woo! Head trippy, weird. No, I have no idea how, like, what the narrative and how they're going to execute it is. Uh, the look and the, their ability to traverse different sort of um, uh, television universes, it looks incredible. Um, and and I'm television all for... What's you that? don't mean like you don't mean like Agents of Shield television like M- and Netflix no. Marvel. No, you mean like the tonal shifts in this. The fact that they go harken back to a, like a Bewitched styles '60s era, you know, sitcom to the more gritty, you know, the, the surrealness. Yeah, a lot of people say it looks akin to Legion, which was another like Fox Marvel show uh, in terms of the head trippiness of it all. It can't end well. Uh, but the the appetite for this show is there. We haven't had a new MCU thing since Spider-Man Far From Home. Yeah. I, and I'm also all for like a superhero show that isn't about just like beating up bad guys, which is what they've all been. So yeah, one of my friends said of, said of this trailer, oh, wow, it's a Marvel thing that doesn't immediately look like a Marvel thing. You know, well done. Yeah. Um, okay. Last bits real quick. I only got three minutes left. CBS All Access getting renamed to Paramount Plus. Sure. Why not? Still looking forward to all the Star Trek shows. Go watch the Lower Decks. Also out today, Console Wars is a new documentary on CBS All Access. I'll watch it. This is like chicken soup, like the high score documentary, you know, probably the same stories you've heard, but you know, it's something solid to put on while eating dinner. Uh, Lego news. We had on Batman Day, a Lego Batwing UCS set. Looks amazing based on the Tim Burton 1989 Batwing Wall model. Wall mountable too. Wall mountable. Some great minifigs that come with that. You got Boombox Henchman and uh, uh, you got the long tail, uh, the, the big tuxedo Joker as well as Batman. And then also um, in Lego news, a Lego Baby Yoda uh, kind of a whole sculptural version that went up for pre-order shipping next month as well. Uh, okay Netflix, yeah, I, not everything needs to be Lego. Yeah, right. you know, like, <laughs> this is one of those like everything. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, Netflix canceled uh, Dark Crystal, Age of Resistance. Won't get a season two. Rather unfortunate there. Uh, I think it's one of those things that it's just not enough people watched it or not enough people bought the merchandise for it. And they, they want it to be a bigger kind of franchise than it ended up being. So uh, the Henson family said they're going to look for new ways to tell that story. So that does it for pop culture this week. We made it to our deadline so I can make my call. We have an outro this week from Great Job. This, uh, oh, I haven't listened to this one, but it's called Jeremy's Disappointment. Let's hear what it says. Sounds like. Hi there, I didn't see you. That's it. Marvel, Marvel and Star Wars, uh, the way that they're approaching these forever franchises are different. I mean, it's, I don't it's, know. it's really fascinating. Like, one thing at a time, right? I 50 mean, years from now. Let's let J.J. have his time in the spotlight. Yeah. I, I got a good feeling about this film. I'm feeling good about the next one. It's all trap. One of the biggest pop culture news items of the year was revealed this week. The title for episode eight. Star Wars in red. The Last Jedi. And hearing from Ryan Johnson and all the other people involved that this is a weird movie. Do you keep hearing that? Too? Yeah. No, I haven't heard it's a weird movie. I heard it's going to be great. <laughs> What did you think of The Last Jedi? I was not happy with the film. <laughs> wow. Obviously, it's all record. I'm, I'm an optimist. <laughs> I have a review for that. Great job. Great job. <laughs> all right. I, I approve. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next week. Bye.